Money is created in an amazing way. Uh, since there is no backing to money anymore, there used to be gold or silver behind money. In those days, money was created when there was a certain amount of gold or silver that was brought into the bank and put into the vault. Then the paper money was issued as more or less like a receipt. Say, we got your gold or your silver in the vault. Here's your receipt. It's got a little, it looks like this, and it's got uh, all kinds of decorations around the side. It says you got $10 or $20 worth of gold or silver. It's a receipt. That was how money was created. And then you could bring the receipt back at any time and get your gold or silver uh, swapped back out. That's the beginning of the process. Well, it didn't stay that way very long in history because the bankers discovered that while they're sitting on all this gold and silver and people are circulating these receipts, that very seldom did all of the receipts come back or even very many of them. People were very content to let the gold and silver sit there and just use the receipts. So the temptation was so great that they began to issue more receipts than there was gold or silver. So what you would do is you take your gold down to the blacksmith who had a safe and he would give you a certificate saying, yes, you have a pound of gold in my safe here. And he would guard your gold, but he'd give you a certificate. Well, when you went to buy a round of drinks for your friends at uh, Harry's Bar, you wouldn't use gold. You'd use the certificates to pay off, uh, you know, the drinks and then those uh, certificates could be redeemed at the blacksmith's place. Well, the blacksmiths started seeing that nobody came back to redeem their gold. They just kept circulating this, this paper. And, and that became, you know, uh, uh, the way that people carried on. Well, pretty soon the blacksmith figured out, well, <clears throat> you know, if they're not coming back for their certificates, uh, I could probably print up a few certificates and nobody would know the difference. And that, that was the beginning of fractional reserve banking, as they call it, in which the money supply begins to expand. And it's artificially expanding because of a decision made by the bankers and later on by the politicians who went into partnership with the bankers that this was an acceptable practice. Of course, the danger with that is that if uh, all of the, or even a substantial number of the depositors did want to take their receipts back to the bank, and demand their gold or silver in return, there wouldn't be enough to keep the obligation. And so there'd be a run on the bank and the banks would have to close their doors and in some cases they'd actually go out of business. They'd be bankrupt and people would lose their deposits. The bankers themselves very seldom lost very much. They might have gone to work for another bank uh, or opened up a new bank uh, down the street, but the depositors often lost a lot of money in this fashion and that was the the reason for going into partnership with the governments because the governments would then say well the law says that the banks can do that legally so there's no prosecution you can't prosecute these bankers anymore because they didn't violate the law because of their partnership with the government the law made it legal to do exactly what they are doing which is one of the reasons that cartels like to go into partnership with with the government The Federal Reserve is a strange creature. There's nothing quite like it out there. Most people think that it is a government agency and that it's here to protect the best interests of the common man. But the truth of the matter is when you cut through all of the debate and all of the research, you come to the startling realization that the Federal Reserve System is a cartel. It's a, a cartel, no different really than a sugar cartel or an oil cartel or a a bean cartel, happens to be a banking cartel. And that means that it is private. It means that the big banks of the United States came together in 1913 and they convinced Congress to pass a law that we call the Federal Reserve Act. This law became the embodiment of the cartel agreement. You see, what cartels do generally is they decide that they don't want to compete with each other. Cartels are made up of different separate companies which on the surface appear to be competitors. And they decide they don't want to compete with each other. 
They want to improve their profit margins and, Im and solidify their position in the marketplace. And so they want to get rid of competition and they decide they're going to fix prices or divide up product or geography or something like that. And they come to cartel agreements to reduce competition between themselves. One of the problems with cartels is that it's very difficult to enforce those rules and regulations, those agreements. How do you do it? If a member of the cartel wishes to drop out and say, I don't want to play anymore, there's nothing that the other members can do unless unless they have made that cartel agreement into law. Now if they've taken the cartel agreement and they passed it through the legislature of the nation, now it becomes law and now when one of the members tries to drop out they can call the government into play and use the police force of the nation to enforce the cartel agreement. Which is why all cartels love to have government involved as a partner. And that is exactly what happened in the banking industry in the United States back in 1913. The Federal Reserve Act is nothing more or less than the laws of the, ru the rules and the regulations, the cartel agreement of the banking fraternity. It's how they decided they would reduce or eliminate competition between themselves and they brought the federal government into it, the Congress, to pass that in the form of law. So, what we're dealing here with here is not a, a government agency at all. Uh, now, it has some of the trappings of political um, appearance because the president appoints the directors to the board of directors and so forth, the, the board of the Federal Reserve System. But the fact is Congress or the president has no control whatsoever over what the Federal Reserve System does. It's completely independent. So, the question arises, is this good or bad for the American people? We have a cartel which has been given the power to create the nation's money, incredibly as that may sound, as credible as that may sound, to create the nation's money, which is something that even Congress is not allowed to do based on, on debt. The Constitution of the United States says that Congress shall create money only when it's backed by coins, when it's backed by something like gold or silver, has intrinsic value. The Congress cannot create money based on debt, according to the Constitution, fiat money. Congress actually gave that power, which it did not have, to this cartel, the banking cartel, which we call the Federal Reserve System. It's an amazing power. And so the private banks of America have a monopolistic power to create the nation's money and they create it out of nothing. There's no gold or silver backing behind it at all. And it's completely up to them as to how much they want to create, when they want to do it, and so forth. They can expand or contract the money supply. Now supposedly they do this in the best interests of the American people. I mean when the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board is called to testify before Congress and uh, he gives his little speech. He says, well, we had to raise interest rates today or we had to lower interest rates today, uh, whatever the case may be. He doesn't say we did this because it was in the best interests of uh, our banks. He always says, well, we did this for you folks. We did this for the American people. We did this because we were concerned about the economy heating up or we're concerned about the economy lagging behind. And we don't want people to be unemployed. We don't want inflation to be too high. It's always for the American people. But the truth is, it's a cartel. And all cartels act uh, with the primary instinct of preserving their own uh, best interests first. So is this in the best interests of the United States and of the American people? It is not, because that means that the money supply, which is the the lifeblood of everything we do is totally controlled by a relatively small group of people who we don't even know their names in most cases. And they are using this power to the benefit of the banking system, not to the benefit of the United States. Well, here's how it works. Remember I said before that the uh, Federal Reserve really is a partnership between uh, government and the banks. 
So when you have a partnership, there has to be a reason, an advantage to both parties to become a partner. So to understand how this works, let's start with the government side of this partnership. Um, the government needs money. Politicians need money. They, they need more and more and more money for whatever purpose. And, but they don't like to raise taxes. They need more money, but they want to lower taxes because that's politically expedient. If they raised the taxes to pay for all of the government projects, why well, there'd be such a, an uproar among the taxpayers that these guys would be voted out of office in, at the next election. So they don't do that. They increase expenses and they try and keep taxes low or lower than normal. How do they do that? Well, they borrow it. That's like anybody else would do. If you want to spend more than you take in, you can borrow. You can steal it, of course, which I think is another good analogy. But uh, in this case, let's just stick with the part of borrowing it. So the, the government goes on record and says, we want to borrow money from the, from the public. And so they offer these government bonds or, or certificates of some kind or another, treasury notes and bills, depending on their maturity dates. And uh, they offer to uh, pay back that money within a certain period of time, plus interest. So now they have this more money that they needed. The trouble with that, of course, is that after the period of time elapses, they've got to pay it back. Well, lo and behold, when it comes time to pay it back, the politicians are still spending more than they're taking in in taxes, and so they don't have it to pay it back. Not to worry, they'll just borrow some more. So they go through a cycle. Well, this time we'll borrow enough to cover the old loans plus the interest and plus a little bit more to expand our government operations. And this goes around and around and around and we have this thing called the rising national debt. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger because the politicians are never expecting to pay back those original debts. And in fact, they never will and you'll see how that works in a moment. They know they never will. The, the money system will just fall apart before they ever have to face that problem, and that'll be, you know, their children and their grandchildren having to deal with that one. Well, no, so far so good. So they borrow this money and the debt goes up and up and up. Uh, and, uh, but, there's, uh, so far, there's no new money created because the money they have borrowed was money that was already in existence. Let's say that uh, I wanted to buy a government bond, so I loan money to the government. No new money is created. They just got some of the original money back in the form of a loan. Where the new money comes into play is at a next step. You see, they never have enough. Uh, they never can borrow enough uh, from the general population or from... Uh, investment firms or from banks or from other countries. There's never enough money out there to borrow. They need more. And so this is where the Federal Reserve comes in. There's usually a margin, anywhere from 7 to 20 to 30 percent of what they need to borrow that just doesn't exist. Or in order for them to borrow it, they would have to raise the interest rates to attract that, that much more money in, and they don't want to raise the interest rates. So now they finally go to their partner, the Federal Reserve System. And they say, okay, partner, here's where uh, you come into the game. We need to borrow today, oh, let's just say another billion dollars. And uh, the Federal Reserve officer says, okay, that's fine. Uh, uh, figuratively, he pulls out the desk drawer, pulls out this big black book, checkbook. Of course, this is all done by computers in reality, but for the sake of analogy here, it's a little easier to visualize with a checkbook. So he writes a check for a billion dollars to the United States government and hands it to the Treasury official. And he says, thank you very much. And he goes down and deposits this billion dollar check into the government's checking account. Okay, so now they have another billion dollars loaned, supposedly. The question is, where did that money come from? What account did it come from? Who put the money into the Federal Reserve System for that billion dollars to be loaned? And the answer is, nobody did. There is no money. It just came out of thin air. It was manufactured just for the purpose of this loan. Now, if you and I were to do that, we'd go to jail. But the Federal Reserve can do it because the government wants them to do it, because they're the lender of last resort. It doesn't make any difference if they, if they can borrow enough money from the private sector at the rates they want to offer. It doesn't make any difference because they know at the last minute they can always go to the Federal Reserve and by obligation, 
The Federal Reserve will create that money out of thin air, just the way they used to do it on the printing presses. Except today they don't use printing presses for most of it because it's checkbook money. It's in a computer. It's digits. It's invisible. They just create it out of thin air. And now this is new money, and the money supply expands on the basis of what money was created for this loan. Now that's just the beginning of the cycle. Um, that's really the smaller side of it. <laughs> this is really peanuts compared to the next cycle that I'm going to describe. So far we've talked about why the government is in this partnership and we can see that their primary motive is because they can have access to any amount of money that they might need at any time without any questions, at any rate of interest they choose to offer. Not a bad deal. But now let's see what happens to that money. Let's assume that the fellow who delivers the mail, the post office worker, gets a check from the post office for $1,000. And now that was newly created money through the process which I just described. It's newly created money and the post office worker doesn't know that it didn't exist the day before anywhere in the universe. He doesn't care. It's spendable money now. So he takes this check to his private bank, commercial bank, down the block and deposits it into his private checking account. Now, finally, the money is out of the government side and goes into the private commercial banking side and this is where the action really heats up. If I were the president of the local bank where this thousand dollars had been deposited, I would have been able to stand up in front of the people there in the bank and say, attention everyone, uh, this gentleman just deposited a thousand dollars into our venerable bank. And everybody would be happy because um, generally people go to the banks uh, to borrow money, a lot of them do. And uh, so they know that if there's money on deposit and there's lots of money to lend, generally that means that the rates of interest are low. So people are happy to know that we have money to lend. You might ask me, uh, well, how much money uh, do you have to loan? And uh, I'd say, well, how much do you need? And you would say, well, I, I was looking at a used car, uh, $9,000 would be about right. And uh, I'd say, I can do that. But you would say, I thought he just deposited $1,000. I would say, yes, he did. And this could go back and forth. And you'd say, well, how can you loan $9,000 when he only deposited $1,000? And if I were a good banker, I would say, don't worry about it, sir. It's all quite legal. It's all regulated by the Federal Reserve System. It's entirely possible. And indeed, it is. Because according to the Federal Reserve regulations, which don't forget are created by the banks for the banks, all the banks have to have at the current time is 10% of their deposits in reserve compared to the amount of loans that they put out. 10% in reserve. So if you take $1,000 and you put that in your accounting ledger under the heading and you put the word on the top says reserve, now you've got $1,000 in reserve and that's 10% of $10,000 which means you can loan $9,000 and still have 10% reserve. So now the banks can literally create $9,000 out of thin air and, and still be quite legal because they've got 10% in reserve. Now that's kind of an oversimplified way of explaining it, but basically that's the accounting that goes on. So the banks will be able to, I would, as a banker, would be able to create $9,000 out of nothing and loan it to you uh, at interest. Now just think about that for a minute. When the government gets money created out of nothing by the Federal Reserve, it uses it for its purposes. It spends it on its programs. But when the banks create that 9,000 for every 1,000, out of thin air. The banks don't use it for their purposes. They don't build their buildings with it and pay their employees with it. They loan it to us. They loan it to institutions. They loan it to anybody that wants to pay the interest rate on it. And so the borrowers use it for their purposes, but the banks collect interest on it. 
And that is an amazing thing when you ponder it, that the banks can collect interest literally on nothing. So when the banks say, we're going to earn 3% or 3.5% on the money we uh, have on deposit, they're not telling you the whole story because that, that money on deposit is used to leverage the creation of nine times more money. So whatever that interest rate is, you can multiply easily by nine, and that's, more close, that's closer to the real effective interest rate that the banks are making. Or if you wanted to be more uh, authentic, you would say, since this money didn't exist, in fact, there is no money, they're, they're collecting interest on nothing, then the interest rate really is infinity. So it's, it's not a bad business to be in, you might say, which is why, of course, the banks are doing pretty well. And uh, so you're able to create, for every billion dollars that's created out of nothing in order to loan to the federal government, now the commercial banks are in a position to create an additional nine billion dollars and push that into the economy, also created out of nothing, but push that into the economy in the form of private loans. This is how money is created, not only in America, but now in most of the world, which follows this general pattern. Actions have consequences. This creation of money and expansion of the money supply ha has a consequence. And not only can the supply expand, but can also contract. And so we have this boom-bust cycle, which would be very difficult if money were based by gold or based on gold or silver, because the supply could not expand or contract rapidly or at the whim of some committee or some political group or some motive like that. It depends on how much gold and silver there is. In the days when money was backed by gold and silver, the supply of money remained very stable. It expanded perfectly in, in proportion to the expansion of the population and an expansion to the economy. So there were no booms and busts in those short periods of time when government didn't allow banks to create money out of nothing. I think the classic example is in the 1920s, you could have taken a $20 bill or a $20 gold piece, because at that point they had a one ounce gold coin which they used as currency. And it was the same value as a $20 bill. And you could go out and buy a complete suit of clothes. You know, three piece suit, tie, uh, the whole works for either one, a $20 bill or a $20 gold piece. Today you can still do the same thing, uh, assuming that it's a modest suit and not an Armani or, or, or a Canali or an Italian uh, vintage, but uh, you can you can spend eight nine hundred dollars on a good suit of clothes, and your twenty dollar bill has maintained its value. Or your twenty dollar gold piece has maintained its value. It'll still buy it. Your twenty dollar bill may take you to the movies, um, you know, popcorn, gummy bears, the whole ball of wax. So it takes more dollars today to buy the same things. Uh, that's the consequence of inflation. As I said, there are consequences, and the consequence generally we see it not only as booms and busts, but as inflation. Right now we're going through a tremendous inflationary period, and I think we're going to see a lot more of that in the future, probably to the point to the extinction of the value of money entirely. Because as that money supply expands, uh, and it expands at a rate faster than the rate of goods and services are expanding, that means that the dollar becomes uh, more and more worthless. And I think a best, the best way to illustrate that is to realize that if we had lived in ancient Rome and we had a one ounce gold coin of the realm at that time, that would have purchased for us a very fine toga, a handcrafted belt, and a pair of sandals. Today, Thousands of years later, if we have a one ounce gold coin with no particular numismatic value, no collector's value, just the value of the gold, we can take that to the bank, exchange it for Federal Reserve notes, run down before it loses value, run down to the clothing store and buy a nice suit, a handcrafted belt and a pair of shoes. The value of one ounce of gold in terms of purchasing power 
has not changed drastically in thousands of years and never can. And the money supply should be based on that kind of a solid principle so that you can depend on its purchasing power. But when you have, when you've broken loose from a backing in the monetary system and now you have just politicians and bankers deciding how much money is going to be created, now you've got this expansion, you've got the devaluation of the purchasing power of the dollar and you have this thing called inflation which means that your savings are being wiped out. The truth of the matter is the average man today, uh, he can work a whole lifetime and he can put his savings into a savings account in terms of dollars and when he gets to the end of his career, those dollars will be withered and withered and withered and practically zero. So inflation is a tax. It's a hidden tax, but it's a very real tax and it's perhaps the most dangerous of all the taxes. That is the heritage of the Federal Reserve System. The only thing that has kept the United States economy going in the 21st century is the expansion of debt. It's all based on a build-up in consumer and government debt. The, the main way they kept it going was they gave credit cards to everybody. And if you maxed out this one, you started on another one. Even more important, Alan Greenspan, in order to cover up the job loss from offshoring, put interest rates down to an enormous low and create, created a housing boom because what's important to people is not the price of the house, it's the monthly mortgage. And when you get rates as low as Greenspan had them, mortgage, the monthly payments drop. When monthly payments drop, housing prices tend to go up. And so people who already had a house saw big rises and they refinanced the house and took out the money and spend it. And so we've, we've had an economy moving along in the 21st century because people are running up credit card bills and because they're refinancing, they were refinancing, rising house prices and spending the equity they had in their homes. Now, what's happened? The housing boom is over. <laughs> There's a bust. Associated with that bust, we have these very curious financial instruments, these subprime loans that were packaged and sold as derivatives, and, and now they are tending to bring down the entire banking system. And, and what are financial institutions holding these subprime derivative, these, security, these securitized packages? What they're doing to maintain their balance sheet is to sell off their good assets. There are stocks in good companies. <laughs> there are bonds that aren't in trouble. And so that's pushed the stock market down, do you see? So the balance sheets of the banks are impaired. No one knows where this is going to end. We've had dire predictions. I don't know where it's going to end either. But these, these uh, huge amounts of these subprime derivatives and securitized loans that people hold. No one, there's no, there's no market for them. No one knows how bad the hit is. And so now the Fed wants to ease money and put more money into the system, but the banks are impaired. Do the banks, who they want, who they're going to lend to? They're, they're going to lend to consumers who can't hold on to their homes from their mortgages, whose credit cards are maxed out, do you see what I'm saying? Throughout history, no nation has ever abandoned a solid monetary system. No nation has ever taken on fiat currency, which is the currency without solid backing, without having its economy destroyed. There are no exceptions. And I see nothing that gives the United States a free ticket. I don't see any reason that the United States should be exempt 
from this uh, law of history. Uh, it seems to me that we have gotten by pretty well, even though we have followed terrible economic practices. We have, we have delayed the day of reckoning, primarily because the United States dollar was the international uh, exchange dollar. It was the dollar of settlements. And everybody wanted it. No matter how much we produced, it seemed like there was an endless demand for it around the world because they always knew somebody else would take it. So there was a lot of psychological element involved there. That era is coming to an end. In fact, I think it has already come to an end where nations around the world eagerly want the United States dollar. They realize that we are debauching the dollar so quickly now. We are inflating it so quickly that it's no longer a desirable currency to have. And so they're looking for alternate currencies. It could be the euro, it could be the yen, it could be, uh, could be anything, but they don't want the U.S. dollar because they know if they hold that dollar very long, they're going to be losing value. The power of the United States rests mainly on the fact that the United States dollar is the world reserve currency. It's been that way since the Second World War. What does it mean to be the world reserve currency? It means that you're the world money and that you can pay your bills in your own currency. If you're running trade deficits, for example, in order to pay your bills, you don't have to uh, sell enough of your goods, export enough to earn the money to pay the other countries for their goods and their money. You just pay it in your money. It also means there's a great demand for your money because it is the reserve of all the foreign central banks. Uh, the foreign central banks keep their reserves in your currency. This means there's a huge market for your currency. It means that, that uh, markets for your assets, assets denominated in dollars, is vast. This means you become the world financial center because any instruments, any, any investment instrument issued in dollars uh, is liquid. It's marketable anywhere. So these are enormous advantages. They're the advantages that Britain once had. When you lose that advantage, you lose a lot. Now, <clears throat> The United States is uh, in the process of losing that advantage. It's losing it because uh, over time, since World War II, other nations have rebuilt, and, and we're no longer the only country that can make things. <laughs> and so you have trade pressures. And we also have a new development, and that is offshoring. What many American corporations have learned is they can increase their profits by discharging the American workforce and having their products that they sell in the United States made abroad, in China, for example, or India, where there are vast underutilized supplies of labor. And there's pressure on companies from Wall Street to improve earnings. And the... Uh, pay packages of top management are related to performance. So now that it's possible, with the collapse of world socialism around 1990, American firms have been moving more and more of their production for American markets offshore. This is doing two things to the economy. Every time an offshore good comes back in, it counts as an import, so it automatically raises imports. So every time an American firm moves a factory abroad, American gross domestic product goes down, foreign gross domestic product goes up, and the trade deficit goes up, or imports go up, which makes the trade deficit go up. So what we now see is we consume about $800 billion every year in goods more than we produce. We've been 
able to do this. It's a, it's a gradual thing that we got into, you know, a little at a time. We're able to do this because people were willing to accept the dollars as payments. It was the reserve currency. Now they have huge numbers of these dollars, and they're beginning to wonder about it. <laughs> they're beginning to say we're really overweighted in our investment portfolios with dollars. And there's a less inclination and therefore, what we've seen during the last six years of the Bush administration is an enormous decline in the value of the United States dollar in relation to other hard currencies, particularly the euro. When the euro was first issued, it was one euro to one dollar. Today, it's a dollar and 52 cents that you have to pay to get one euro. This is an enormous decline. Now, so, so what you see happening is pressure on the dollar, which eventually is going to raise prices, uh, pressure on jobs. In the 21st century, the United States has been able to create net new jobs only in uh, domestic services, non-tradable services. We're not creating jobs in exports. We're not creating uh, jobs in information technology or high-tech type of service jobs. We're creating jobs with waitresses and bartenders and uh, ambulatory health care and hospital orderlies and social service and school teachers. So that what were very uh, strong and important ladders of upward mobility so people could rise up into the middle class and higher, are being dismantled by the offshoring of middle class jobs and by the importation of foreigners on work visas. Uh, if you don't want to hire an American engineer, you claim a shortage, and then you bring in one from abroad at a much lower salary. And so, so we see... Uh, uh, the impact on science and engineering in the United States, research, development, these sorts of things start stagnating and slowly uh, eroding. And in manufacturing, we, you, you lose all the supply chains that are in the process that enable you to be able to make something. This piece of the chain is moved offshore, and then this piece moves offshore. And then before long, uh, the, the sort of middle-level firms who were supplying the big firms. There's no, the big firms don't want them anymore. They're offshore. So this then hits the tax base of local communities. When you outsource manufacturing jobs to Asia and then you uh, insource cheap labor to drive down the price of labor for the jobs that remain, uh, it becomes like the back of the shampoo bottle. It's like shampoo, rinse, repeat. And, and you really see it. Uh, Mexi the Mexican government was building a $2 billion deep sea port in Baja Peninsula. And you really can see it there. So you outsource manufacturing to Asia. And then once the port is open on the Baja Peninsula, you import the manufactured finished goods into Baja, where you skip OSHA, you skip the Longshoremen's Union. And then you put it on NAFTA trucks and drive it into a Walmart in the middle of the country. Uh, so. You, you, you see what can obviously happen on that cycle. So, and what, what, what gets washed out of that is a whole class of jobs, is a whole, essentially, the business model has said that it is no longer economically viable for certain types of jobs to be done in the United States of America. Light manufacturing is clearly one of them. Maybe heavy manufacturing is one of them. It becomes a real problem in certain critical industries. For instance, we've been throwing pork spending, pork barrel spending, at some shipyards down in uh, Mississippi. Trent Lott was very good at getting that money for the shipyards down there in Mobile. And we really needed to do it. This was good, healthy pork because, you know, in a time of national emergency, uh, you can't just flip a switch and start building ships. You have to have an infrastructure and you have to have a workforce that knows how to build ships. 
which means that, yeah, we'll have to waste some money building some unnecessary ships just to keep at least the seeds of an infrastructure of a shipbuilding industry in case there actually is a need for that emergency. Offshoring is a fancy way of saying your job is in question because you can be replaced for a fraction of your cost. If you're paid nineteen, twenty, thirty dollars an hour, you can be replaced by someone who's willing to do the same job for a dollar an hour, twenty-five or even fifty cents an hour, with no benefits, with no pension. And so the the direction for, for Wall Street firms for, for corporate America is clear. If you need to solidify your profit margins, that's the first place to go is renegotiate your labor contracts and start moving uh, the jobs someplace else. Uh, the implications for the worker are this, um, you're out of a job. <laughs> That's just plain and simple. Y you don't have a job, which means you're probably going to have to retool and re-educate because that job's not coming back. It's, it's tough. It's easy to go from paying someone 30 cent at $30 an hour to 25 cents. Pretty difficult for the company to reverse that and go from 25 cents back to $30 an hour. That's not good for the bottom line at all. The jobs that are gone are gone for good. Uh, in addition to that, we're, we're shuttering the plants. We're shuttering uh, the facilities that have created the nation's wealth. Uh, they're gone. We're, we're, we're making them go away. We don't need them. We don't need them. In a global world, as the argument would go, uh, it's better to utilize resources where they're cheaper. And, you know, so do we get a cheaper toaster oven at Walmart? Yeah, you get a cheaper toaster oven. But it's a hidden bargain. To me, it's a bad bargain. Because what happens to the guy that used to make the toaster oven? What happens to his family? Now the social costs of that are passed on to the community that no longer has a factory that now like, uh, uh, you know, when Maytag used to make their stuff in Galesburg, is it Galesburg, Illinois? Somewhere in uh, Illinois. And they were there for 75 years and they got tax credits to stay and they left anyway because their workers were making $15 an hour and they moved the factory to Mexico where they were paying people $1 an hour. expense of all this, the red ink, it's a deficit, is financed by the Chinese and the Japanese who use all the surplus dollars they earn from their trade surpluses in the United States to buy U.S. government bonds. Now when it reaches the point, as it appears to be doing, that the Chinese feel that they don't really want any more of these bonds, that they're loaded up on American assets, 1.3 trillion at the moment, and they cease to be our creditors, how do we finance the federal government? The American saving rate is uh, about zero, so the Americans can't buy the bonds. Uh, people haven't had any, the, the, the median income of families has not gone up in the United States in a couple of decades, perhaps longer. There's no growth in the real income of anybody outside the very highest income levels. So, and they're all struggling. They're, they're drowning in credit card debt. Many of them now can't deal with their mortgages. How are you going to raise the taxes? So if you put all that together, you can see that it's headed to, to a new kind of crisis. And if the United States government wakes up one day and has to deal with the fact that the dollar is no longer accepted as reserve currency, what is it going to do? I think the end of the era is upon us. All of those dollars that they generally call euro dollars that are all around the world, what are those people going to do with them? They don't want them anymore. So they'll start looking for ways to send them back to the United States and buy things while they still can before the value is completely gone. And so we're already beginning to see this reversal of the cash flow back into the United States. And the money is coming in in tremendous quantities. So not only do we have 
Oh, by the way, why is it coming in and what are they doing with it? Well, they're trying to buy up our goods and services or buy up our politicians or buy up real estate or corporations. Uh, they're even buying up banks now, you might have noticed. Uh, they're sending this money back to the United States to buy a, a, a strong interest in some of the biggest banks of America. The banks need the money. And, uh, and sometimes the, the pundits will say, well, look, we're getting capital back into the United States. No, they don't understand the difference between money and capital. Capital is wealth. Capital is ownership. Capital would be a stock in a corporation. Money is just pieces of paper. So what we're doing is we're, we're losing capital, real capital, which means ownership in the productivity and the business um, entity of America, we're shipping the capital out and getting worthless paper dollars back in. And so that's what they're doing with this money. And so not only are, is the Federal Reserve expanding the money supply very rapidly to pay for all of its programs, to pay for its wars, to pay for its welfare, to pay for bailing out uh, people whose homes are in trouble, they're just, they're just creating money like crazy. Uh, to do this without raising taxes, and now we got a proposal to lower taxes while they're increasing spending. The insanity is incredible. Not only is that happening, but all this other money for the past uh, 30, 40, 50 years that's been around the country is also coming back in. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out when all this money comes into the United States, it just gets more and more worthless. And your savings and my savings will become worthless too. The price of a, of a loaf of bread, Lord knows what it's going to be, but it's going to be many times higher than it is now. A depression is a period of time during which most people's standard of living drops significantly. There are other good definitions of a depression. That's a nice, broad, general one. And I believe that because there is such a thing as the business cycle, which we don't have time to go into now, but uh, I, the problems that we had in the 1930s, we're going to see that type of a phenomenon again. It's not going to be like the 1930s, it's going to be different. Uh, the similarity is going to be a massive drop in the uh, general standard of living. And I call it the Greater Depression. Uh, the U.S., especially for the last 15 years, our main export, our main product has been dollars, which are unbacked liabilities of the U.S. government. And we've been able to ship these things abroad by the trillions, and these nice foreigners ship us all kinds of good things. They ship us Mercedes and Sonys and, and cocaine and oil and all kinds of things, and we just give them dollars. But now there's six trillion of these dollars out there, and these people are starting to realize that they're holding hot potatoes. And they don't want to all run towards the exits at once, but they know what they've got. They've got just pieces of paper that are worth, that are unsecured liabilities of a bankrupt government. And these dollars are going to start flowing back into the U.S. And inflation is going to explode in this country. Uh, interest rates are going to go through the ceiling. It's going, to, it's going to be devastating for the average American. What you see happen is uh, a big reduction in real living standards for 90, 95% of the population. The living standards will just all of a sudden be uh, adjusted downward substantially. Now, many of these people are already hard pressed. So what comes from that? And then you have to see that means that the real purchasing power has shrunk, and so the real goods and services that are coming off the shelves has shrunk. That's recession. That's more unemployment. It's a dangerous situation. That's what I say. It's, it's unprecedented. That's why I call it a calamity in the making. I don't say that it has to happen, but it's going to happen if they don't make some big changes soon. If, if, it, if things continue to go on, if we continue to think in all our hubris that we're the superpower and the world adjusts to us, it's going to hit the fan because that ain't the case. That is not the case. 
So what are they going to do about it? And um, they're going to go to their government. They're going to say, please help us. They're going to go to the same politicians, the very same politicians who got him into this mess, and ask them to solve the problem, which is a huge mistake. Because these politicians already have the solution in mind. What they're planning to do is let the American, in my opinion now, is to let the American dollar collapse. Um, that way they don't have to pay back the national debt, remember? They, they have all this tremendous national debt in dollars and all this tremendous uh, obligation, which they can never repay. So it's to their advantage just to let the dollar disappear and wipe that off the books.